Hello, hello, and happy Marvelous Monday, everybody. Welcome to the Landlord and Tenant Talk with me. I'm your host, Carissa, and I'm super excited to have you join me today. I am talking about the seven dangers of rental housing. Um, I promise that the information I share is not legal advice. However, it is the industry's best tips and practices. I want to say welcome to those of you who are tuned in live on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, as well as Twitter. And for those of you who are watching the replay, thank you so much. Listen, if you have questions, if you have comments, remarks, or observations, go ahead and throw it in the comment section. This is what I do each and every Monday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I bring information to help the entire rental community. So this, this segment, this topic is for landlords, but it's primarily for tenants today. But tune in because I'm going to give some tips for landlords. I'm going to give three tips for tenants. And so, again, I want to share the seven dangers in rental housing. So a lot of people are really asking, Carissa, what's going on in the rental community? Why are we starting to see so many lawsuits? Why are so many tenants now taking action against landlords? Well, those are all great questions and I hope to tackle those questions and address the questions that you have sent. Some have sent in by way of email. Some have sent the questions in by way of inbox messages on my various social media platforms. So today, I hope to share information and make sure that it's clear. Um, let me know where you're tuned in from. I love to know what my viewers are watching for, from. Let me know which platform you're watching on. Let me know your geographical location because all of that does matter to me. I always enjoy knowing that you're tuned in. I want to make sure that my audio is good. So if something happens, just throw a comment in the um, the comment section there. Let me know that you know, you're um you're watching live, you're watching the replay, any questions, comments, any challenges that we have, I definitely want to work through those today. So I'm going to dive straight into my topic today because it is a much needed conversation that we should be having. And I think that uh, for many of us in, to rent, in the rental community space, if we have more of these honest conversations and we are asking the right questions, we can get the right answer. All right. So every Monday is a different topic. It's a different subject matter, um, but it's pertaining to both landlords as well as tenants. And so I'm going to get into it because I do have a lot to cover. So I'm talking about the seven dangers in rental housing. Uh, but before I do, I want to get started. I want to acknowledge my students who are tuned in, who are chiming in. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for tuning in. All right. So listen, it's all about the seven dangers in rental housing. I want you all to like, to tag, and or share this information today. Again, it's primarily for tenants, but I'm sharing tips for both tenants and landlords. I want you to take a lot of notes today. For those of you who are watching, especially my students, um, please take note of the information that I'm sharing today. If you are in some sort of housing subsidy program, or maybe you know someone who is, such as Section 8, Rapid Rehousing, veterans, um, the homeless population, anybody in the rental housing community, that's who this segment is for today, because you need to know that as a tenant, you do have rights, okay? Now, landlords, they do have a responsibility and I'm going to touch on that in a little bit, but I do want to address my tenants first because I have a large population of viewers who are tenants and they're always saying, well, Carissa, you give so much information to landlords and you give very little to us. So I want to start with the tenants first today, if that's OK. All right. So this is definitely going to be thought provoking. Um, don't mean to step on anybody's toes. Don't mean to ruffle anybody's feathers. But I understand that sometimes when we have these honest conversations, it may do just that. And at the end of the day, it's OK, because I hope to bring awareness to a lot of rental communities throughout the United States. All right. So let me just say that. Um, and so, again, we're talking about the seven dangers in rental housing. OK, so. I have, let me just give you a little bit about me. I have been in this space in property management, real estate for almost 
um, three decades, and I know that I'm dating myself, um, but I've been in the rental community for so long that I am no longer surprised by some of the things that I see. However, some things are still disturbing to me because not only am I a landlord and tenant expert, not only have I been in this space in property management for almost 30 years, I'm a housing educator and I like to educate tenants as well as landlords because I recognize that sometimes people just don't know, right? And so that's why I bring this information to you every week, every Monday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can catch me right here on this social media platform. All right. So here are the first seven. I'm going to go in order. Here are the first seven. Uh, these are things that are of concern. And sometimes these are commonly overlooked um, things that are happening. These are issues. These are concerns. But here's the first one. Unexpected maintenance issues. These can be costly to landlords, but definitely disruptive to tenants. And so as a tenant, one of the things that you do want to understand about any rental community, whether it is an apartment, it could be a condo, it could be a house, a trailer home, single family home, it doesn't matter what the rent, what the type is of the rental property. There are sometimes unexpected maintenance issues. Now, if you understand what to look for, so let's Let's just say that as a tenant, and I know that a lot of tenants are looking to move um, around this time of the year. So let's just say you're a tenant and you're looking to relocate. You're looking for a new rental housing, right? The one thing that you always want to do is a thorough inspection of that rental property before you submit your application. Here's how I like to guide tenants. When you're doing the walkthrough, open all of the open and close all of the doors, open and close all of the windows. Do they open properly? Do they lock properly? Turn on the faucet in the kitchen, turn on the faucet in the bathroom. If it has a shower, turn that on. Look under the cabinets in the bathroom in the kitchen. If it's a house and if it has a basement, walk down to the basement. Explore in that rental property because that is the place that you will potentially be calling home. And you want to make sure that you understand how well or not a landlord is taking care of that rental property. OK, so do a thorough walkthrough and ask questions. If you see something, say something. That's one of the things that I always say. I'm a very candid person, I'm a very transparent person. So in the property management space, for instance, at a time where I was conducting like open houses and I was doing tours, I would have multiple tenants um, and families come in and tour that rental property at the same time. But before I actually showed that property, my team and I, we got into that property, we made sure that it was clean. If it was not clean, we did not show it. If repairs were needed, we made sure that the repairs were taken care of in advance. And so if you are looking to move, walk through the property, drive by the property during the day, drive by at night, go by that rental place over the weekend just to make sure that you understand that that's where you want to call home. Now, I'm not saying that landlords can control what's happening on the outside of the property. So let's say, for instance, it is maybe in a high crime area, and I'm going to touch on that in a minute. Landlords can't control what's happening outside of that rental property, but you can control based off of what you see according to whatever is going on in that environment. So if, if it's not a good fit, then it's not a good fit. You can't make something fit that's not comfortable for you. And so that's the first thing that I want you to understand as a tenant. I see your comments in the comments um, box and I'm going to come to you after this one. You want to make sure that you are not trying to move into a place that is overpriced, right? Now, here's why that's important. And I know that sometimes some properties will offer a lot of value, right? But sometimes the price may be out of your budget. The, the price may be out of your range. So here is the rule of thumb. If, for instance, the rent is $1,000 a month, your income should be at least three times that amount if you are a market tenant. Now, if you're participating in some sort of housing subsidy program, 
You don't have to worry about that. You just want to make sure that the rent is affordable or will be approved by whatever housing program you're participating in. So that's first and foremost. I know a lot of people are complaining that rents are high. Well, listen, at the end of the day, for landlords, it is a business and they should be treating it like a business. And location is everything. So for those of you who play, I'm going to go old school. When I was much younger and actually in some of my property management classes, I bring out the board game called Monopoly. How many of you remember the board game Monopoly? Has, has anybody played Monopoly? Show me some love in the comment section. Let me know if you understand the concept of Monopoly. Hey, Jennifer, thank you for tuning in. Beautiful. All right. And so if you ever played the board game Monopoly, you're essentially competing with other players to purchase real estate, right? And so it just depends on where the property is. So you have, for instance, like Baltic Avenue that may be on the low end of the board. You may have um, Park Place or Boardwalk that's on the high end. Now, just depending on where you purchase that property at on that board game of Monopoly, that will determine, number one, how much you can charge for rent, OK, and it also depends that also will determine how much you pay for that property. And the same is true in real life. When you are living in a rental property, always remember that location is everything. Landlords and owners, they have to pay taxes. Some are paying mortgages. Some are paying um, you, utilities and other expenses that comes along with owning a rental home or a rental property, okay? And so every year, the taxes may increase, the insurance may increase, the utilities, the cost to uh, just maintain that property could increase every year. And sometimes, and in many cases, landlords will pass along those fees and those increases to tenants. If they're making upgrades, if they're renovating the place, if they're doing capital improvements and significant repairs, landlords should be able to recoup that money. All right. And I know that sometimes people again, I know that people are complaining that the rent is too high. Well, there are ways that you can make it affordable for you. If you're a market tenant, you can maybe look at getting a roommate. That's just one option. There are so many other options, but I'm not going to get in that today. Um, but I do have strategies for you to understand the importance of making sure that you rent something that you can actually afford to pay. All right. So here is my next tip. This is another danger. OK, I'm talking about the seven dangers today. There are some dishonest landlords. OK, dishonest landlords, they could hide um, issues related to the property or violate lease agreements. The one thing that I do want tenants to understand is the importance of steering clear of what I like to call shysty landlords or slum landlords. I'm not bashing anybody because I know that there are a lot of good landlords who watch my show, who watch me on YouTube, you watch me on LinkedIn. But I want tenants to understand that you can also do a background check, not just of the property, but you can check out that landlord. How long have they been in business? Do they have a renter's license? And there are other things that you can, as a tenant, check, know, and understand about that, that rental property as well as the landlord. One of the things that I always tell tenants to do is to look at the reviews of that property. If it's a large complex, get on social media and see what's going on. Um, I have had the pleasure of managing and overseeing some troubled property in my tenure as a property manager. And I said, I've had the pleasure of it because one of the things that I am is I am a fixer. I'm a troubleshooter. So you put me in a bad community. I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to improve the quality of housing for the tenants. And I'm going to increase the, the return on that owner's investment. That's just what I do. That's what I specialize in. And so most of my career, that's what I have done. I've worked a lot of communities in troubled or high crime areas. And I'm one of few individuals, and I know there are quite a few out there, but I am one of the few individuals in, in my circle um, who's not afraid to get into those communities um, because I recognize that somebody got to do it. So, um, and that was just something that I did. 
All right, so let's see here. Hey, Lynette, thank you so much for tuning in from North Carolina. I'm talking about the seven dangers in rental property. So um, thank you for tuning in, beautiful. You said, I definitely need you down here in Charlotte <laughs> to help clean up the system. Listen, if they're willing to pay, I will come as a consultant, but I will not come as a property manager. So please let your uh, landlord know that they can definitely reach out to me. Uh, my team and I, we would love to get on the road and come down and help you all out down there. Uh, so here is another danger in rental housing unsafe neighborhoods. So usually in unsafe neighborhoods, um, the rents are a little bit cheaper. And this is, I won't say that it's primarily because of high crime, but it could be. So remember, I talked about the board game Monopoly, right? So on Monopoly, there are low paying rents in some of those communities on Monopoly. Same thing is true in every state. There are good neighborhoods, there are bad neighborhoods. And usually in neighborhoods where the crime is high, the value of the property is low, you, you, you tend to see those lower rent amounts. Now, every once in a while, you can stumble across landlords who have a heart for people and they won't charge a whole lot of rent. Listen, I have friends and colleagues who have um, hundreds and thousands of doors, and they really have a heart for all of their tenants. They don't raise the rent. They don't give rent increases unless they absolutely have to. And I commend them for that. But sometimes you will find those lower rent amounts in communities that may be in areas that some people don't want to live in. Now, some do maybe. And, and I had one community um, where I managed many, many years ago when I got into property management and I was working with the owner. It was in a really bad area in Washington, D.C. It was a neighborhood that I would not have recommended to my enemy because that's how bad it was. And there was nothing that the owner could do to improve to improve the quality of that property just because of where it was. I think it was on one of the worst streets in Southeast DC. Now DC has like other major cities that have really, really bad parts, but, and I, I really, you know, I felt really bad for this owner because they couldn't get the property rented or if they were able to get it rented, they oftentimes found themselves renting to tenants who, um, were not the most desirable tenant based off of the behavior, based off of the activity and their, their, you know, their familiarity with um, things and people that were going on in the community. So that's the, that's the best way that I can put that. That's the cleanest way that I can say that. Um, and so, but sometimes that can be heartbreaking if you own property as an owner, if you own property and it's in a high crime area, Sometimes you can't charge top rent because the community just won't yield that amount, right? And so that's something that's out of a landlord's control. Owners cannot control those high crime areas. Now, there are things that they can do to possibly reduce or minimize crime, um, but they can't control the element and what's happening outside of their rental property. Now, here's another danger. After unsafe neighborhoods, here's the next one inflexible lease terms. So this could trap tenants to unfavorable conditions. So for instance, let's say you move into a rental property or you're looking to rent a property and the terms are just not favorable. Maybe the landlord wants to lock you in for two years versus a 12, um, two years versus a one year or 12 month lease term. You want to ask questions up front to understand the lease term. If you know you only want to live there for a year or maybe you're looking to rent somewhere short term, inquire about whether or not that owner is willing to offer a three, a six or nine month lease versus a 12 or 24 month lease. OK, and so don't feel pressured. Ask questions because sometimes landlords are flexible. But you don't know unless you, unless you are that person to ask those questions up front. Here's another danger. Privacy concerns. Some landlords do overstep their boundaries. Some landlords will go above and beyond. I've had some colleagues of mine 
um, who own property, they were not having the best time with their tenants. Some of those landlords actually hate their tenants. Um, I had one young lady, she said to me, Carissa, I wish I can just burn the, pro the, the property down um, with the tenant inside because her and the tenant, they were having such a hard time. And that was really, really harsh, but I understood her hurt. I understood her pain and I knew what she was dealing with. Um, and that's heartbreaking. And so in that, she was kind of hard on the tenant with um, popping up and not giving advance notice that she was going to the property. And she was just really, really, really making it hard for that tenant. And you have to understand that as a tenant, landlords are required by law to give you advance notice. Now, it just depends on where that rental property is. That will determine how much advance notice that landlord must give you. And so you have to understand and know what the laws are in your jurisdiction. All laws are not the same. So I don't give specific information on laws because number one, I'm not an attorney. I don't give legal advice. And then number two, the laws are going to be different just depending on if it's in Maryland or Virginia or California or North Carolina or New York. So the laws are different per state. All right. And then also, let me add this, that there are three sets of laws. There are federal laws, there are state laws, and there are local laws with the exception of Washington, D.C., because Washington, D.C. is not a state. All right, here is another danger of rental housing, the risk of eviction. So when there is non-compliance with any lease term, this can definitely lead to eviction. And this is one of the things that sometimes tenants oftentimes overlook. You have to understand as a tenant what your responsibilities are. Please read the terms of that rental lease agreement. And as a matter of fact, let me make it, let me just make it a little bit clear. Before you sign your next lease, ask the landlord if you can review it first. Here's why that's important because you want to understand what you are signing. Okay. And if you come across a landlord who is thorough like I am, or they've been tuned into me, you may sign a lease package like mine, no exaggeration, whenever I've conducted a new lease up, meaning that a tenant is signing a lease, they're taking possession of the property, I'm giving them the keys and they're moving in. My lease package is at least 61 pages long. 61. But here's why I do that, because I recognize that it is a business and at the end of the day, I want to make sure that that asset is protected. But I also want to make sure that it's clear, it's understandable what the tenant can expect of me, the owner or whoever. And then tenants need to understand what role they play. I provide a lot of information, a lot of details about that rental property, um, who's responsible for paying utilities. If the tenant is responsible for paying utilities, I provide information on that uh, utility service provider, whether it's for water, gas, electric, oil, or whatever. I'm providing that information. I'm giving a rundown about pest control. And there are a lot of other things that I include in that lease package. Um, and so as a business owner, I do hope that at the very least, that you are as thorough as that to provide all of your rules, your policies, and any other information you want tenants to have in writing, okay? And so as a tenant, that's why it's important that you read it first. If you have questions, ask your question before you sign your lease. Because here's the thing. Let's say, for instance, and I know that a lot of people do this um, because sometimes people are desperate. People are just rushing and they're just anxious to move into the property. They will sign a lease without reviewing it first. That is the biggest mistake that anybody can make but I get it. Sometimes people need to desperately move. They have other situations that they're working on. There are other emergencies that may pop up at the last minute, right? And people would just sign it without reviewing it. Please don't make that mistake because if you sign a lease, not having read it first and something happens and you go to your landlord and you say, oh, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Landlord, I didn't know that was in there. I never would have agreed to that. And your landlord can say too bad, so sad, you signed it. It is a legally binding document. And 
because it is legally binding, that means that your landlord can take you to court for anything that you violate. So if you sign an agreement and then your actions are the opposite of what you signed, then that would be a violation of the lease. And actually, they should take you to court if you're violating the lease. So please understand what you are signing before you sign your next lease. All right. So I do have tips for tenants. I've been given some tips and some gems along the way. Um, but I want to give these tips to help you navigate these challenges. OK, here's the first one. As I indicated before, you can do a thorough research about the property, about the landlord. And if you do that, you have a better understanding of where you are moving to. Thank you for sharing. Um, here is the second tip for tenants. Understand your rights as a tenant. And if you don't know, do a Google search or do some research to understand what your tenant rights are in that area, wherever you live at. So if you live in Charlotte, if you live in South Carolina, if you live in Brooklyn, New York, if you live in Los Angeles, California, if you live wherever, check the laws, check what the what your um, your tenant rights are. So usually every state have landlord and tenant laws. And if you just do some research, you can find out what that is. OK, here's a third tip for tenants. Please make sure that you maintain open, honest communication with your landlords, okay? Please, as a tenant, I know sometimes tenants are angry with their landlord, but there are really good tenants out there and they're, they're really respectable. Um, but maintain that open and honest communication with your landlord. Ask questions and please, by all means, if something has happened in a rental property, you don't have to threaten the landlord. Don't try to beat the landlord up. Don't disrespect the landlord. They're human as well. They have issues. They have concerns. They may have challenges going on. And so I strongly encourage open and honest communication. All right. So here are some tips for landlords, because I know that a lot of landlords are interested in looking to build a positive reputation and to have a quality relationship with their tenant. And so here's the first tip for landlords today. Be transparent about the property's condition and the lease term. So if you have a rental property, let's say something happened last minute and maybe a pipe burst or uh, there is some sort of emergency situation that created a needed repair on the day of the tour. Let the prospect know that um, something's happened. You do have to take care of it. You are going to take care of it. Give them a deadline. Or maybe you have a tenant in place and you have to make some repairs. And maybe it's not an emergency repair, but you still have to make repairs. Communicate that to the tenant. Let them know when they can expect the repair to be completed, when the renovation will be finalized. Communicate that. Let them know up front what the lease terms are. Let them know as a landlord what you are expecting. And here's what I always do at the end of the day. I would rather run people away. If I'm looking to rent property, right? I, let's, let's just say I'm renting out my property, right? I have rules. I have policies. And I want people to know what they are before they move in and, and, and take possession of the property. So I'm going to go over the rules. I'm going to go over the regulation. I'm going to tell them what we are looking for in our tenant. And I would rather run away a tenant who knows they're not going to be able to maintain or adhere to the rules and the regulation. I'm not wasting my time. I'm not wasting their time. And I am minimizing headaches by being upfront, honest, and transparent in the beginning. So I strongly recommend that you do that. Here's the second tip for landlords. Respect your tenant's privacy and their right. I said it before and I will say it again. We are going to see a lot more landlord and tenant cases in court where tenants are taking landlords to court because the pandemic has crippled a lot of people into believing that as a landlord or a property manager that they can do whatever they want. And that is simply not true. There are laws in place and violating a tenant's privacy 
is not a covered law that protects you as a landlord. OK, so you can get yourself in a lot of trouble if you are violating your tenants rights. OK, there was there was an article I saw about a week or two ago where a landlord secretly planted cameras at the rental property and was spying on the tenant and did not tell the tenant that those cameras were there. That is a violation of their privacy. There are privacy laws in place. OK, there are privacy laws in place that protects tenants. So please make sure that you are not violating tenants rights. Please, even if you have tenants who are not cooperating with you, who are not respecting you, they're still human. Right. And so if there is some sort of lease violation, enforce your lease. You can't control a person's behavior. See, here's the thing about rental property or rental property business. You're not managing the behavior. You're managing that that property and you're managing that landlord and tenant relationship. And if you ever find yourself in a situation where things are just not cordial, you can't respect each other, you can't see eye to eye, maybe step back. Don't wear your emotions on your sleeve. Don't get bent out of shape. Don't cuss the tenant out. I know that some watching have done that. Um, and some of you are currently doing that. Please stop that. That is not a professional practice. And so there are better ways to handle and resolve disputes. At the end of the day, err on the side of caution because you don't know the stress or the pressure that some of these tenants are dealing with. There have been so many reportings on the news where tenants have um, created or conducted or for whatever reason, just did stuff to landlords, violent behavior, some fatal um, some I can't even mention because it's just so heartbreaking. You don't know when a person is going to snap, right? And so I give this advice to landlords as well as tenants. It's a business. Treat it like a business. It's not a boxing match. It's not a boxing ring. You know, this is not a hate love type of relationship unless it is. And if so, that's your business. Um, but keep it professional and respect your tenants rights and their privacy. And then also, here's a third tip for uh, landlords today. Maintain your property and make sure that it's in good condition. So I always, always, always recommend that landlords conduct inspections. Okay, make sure that you are inspecting your property. And if you are not inspecting your property, make sure that you hire someone who can do that for you. I strongly recommend to do uh, an inspection at least. I try to do them, I would recommend quarterly. So you want to make sure that it's in writing. You want to make sure that it's clear. You want to make sure your tenant understand the frequency of those inspections. If it's every three months, if it's every four months, if it's every six months, if it's once a year, it should be more than once a year. Okay, let me just say that. You should always be doing multiple inspections of your rental property. This is the only way that you know the condition of that property. And it can be so easy for you. You put a system in place to make sure that you are doing that. You want to stay on top of repairs because ultimately, not only are you improving the quality of the that tenant's home, but you're also reducing the cost of repair. So let's say, for instance, there's a water leak. And I see your comments in the comment section. I'm coming to you shortly. So there, let's say there are water leaks. And this is one of the things that I always talk about because where there is a water leak, there is a high water bill, right? And so if you are conducting an inspection of the property, all of your property, you know whether or not the toilet is running, if the faucet is leaking in the tub, if if it needs a washer, if it, you know, if it needs um, repair, right? When you are conducting inspections, you know that these things need to be done. And if you do it quickly, you can reduce that water bill and you can you can potentially eliminate a further issue from happening. So I shared a couple of segments ago, there was a client of mine who had a rental property. There was a water leak on the first level, which kept leaking and it kept dripping down to the basement level. And so over time, the problem just grew worse. And not only did it damage the first floor, it damaged the second floor and then mold started to grow. And because that landlord 
did not conduct inspections timely. And because that landlord did not make repairs timely, it ended up costing them more money. It cost them thousands of dollars where it might have just cost a couple of hundreds. And so please make sure that as a landlord, you are doing that. Note the condition of the property before tenants take possession. Note the property when you are conducting inspections with pictures and videos. And there are other techniques and strategies that you can use to make sure that you're capturing the condition of that rental property. So those are the three tips that I wanted to share um, with landlords. I've shared tenant tips. Hello. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, Dr. Baker, thank you for tuning in. You said, wow, mode and investors removal is costly. Absolutely. That comes at a great cost. That's not cheap. Let me just touch on pest control. I didn't put that on here, but pest control is a big issue. I had a rental property that I was responsible for overseeing. And it was, I think that was a 12 unit building. And I went in because the owner lives out of the country the prior property management uh, firm didn't do a great job with maintaining the property. So the property was infested with bed bugs. OK, if you ever seen bed bugs, not only are they ugly, um, but they spread fast. They reproduce quickly. OK, and it's a hard problem as well as could be an expensive problem to get rid of. So in that rental property, one unit was infested. It was not taken care of. So those bed bugs went to another unit. They don't just stay in one spot. They're going to bring all their cousins and their cousins' cousins, and they're going to just have family reunions every day, right? So it gets into the, um, the tenants' um, furniture, their clothing, the carpet behind the walls, the outlets in the wall. And it is a costly problem to have to get rid of. There are a couple of ways to do it, but at the end of the day, it could be expensive because you don't know how severe that infestation problem is. And when I say infestation, I mean anything in quantities of two or more. That's what infestation is, two or more. Dr. Baker, you said bed bugs are worse than roaches. Absolutely. I don't like them either way. I don't like bed bugs. I don't like roaches. I don't like ants. I don't like spiders. I don't like the silverfish, the little things with the creepy crawly legs. I don't like cockroaches. I don't like mice. Listen, I've seen it all in rental property. I, I inspected one property, Dr. Baker, where there was an infestation of snakes. And I could not go back to that property because I don't do snakes. And I'm a country girl. OK, I love animals. But snakes is one of those individuals, one of those animals rather that. That's like the last of my list. I can do one, okay? Like if I had a pet snake, it would be a python. But more than that, that's a problem for me, right? But infestation is, is defined as two or more. And so it's always better to err on the side of caution and making sure that, again, as a tenant, you understand what your rights are as a tenant. Ask questions to your potential or your current landlord if you have questions. Um, and then just have those open and honest lines of communication and conversation to understand what you're supposed to do, understand when things are going to happen, if they're going to be timely, understand that that rental lease agreement is going to make a big difference if you know in advance. And if you already know that you cannot adhere or maybe you're going to have a problem with a landlord who says there is no smoking at the property and you know you want to smoke marijuana or whatever you like to smoke. That might not be the property you want to move into. Or if, for instance, a landlord said that this is a no pet community, you agree to that and then you turn around and you bring a pet the next day or the next week, that's a violation of the lease. Don't put yourself in a situation that could come as a double negative against you. Here's how that could work as a double negative. Number one, that landlord can take you to court for violating the lease. And if a judge or if a court gives a judgment and you're actually evicted for violating the lease, it's going to make it hard for you to find somewhere else to live. So that will be a double negative for you. So ask questions up front. Know what you're getting into. OK, that's that's the best way that I can say that. Know what you are getting into before you say I do. 
Dr. Baker, you said no, keep them snakes. No, I was I like to share them with you. Uh sad lieutenants sneak pets in and get in their feelings when they are put out. Yeah, that that's so true. And I know that a lot of people have pets and they are their family. And and I get it. Like I said, I love pets. And when my kids were young, um, they had pets. We had dogs and we had those little ferret thingies that's funky and just funk up the, the whole house. Like my kids, they had it all right. But that's, that's also how I grew up. I grew up with a lot of animals because I'm a country girl. And so I had dogs and chickens and cats and yeah, I rode pigs and all that stuff. True story I did in a country. Um, and so I get it. Right. And so people like what they like, whether it's a pet, whether it's an emotional support animal, whether it's a service animal, people like animals. But if it's not an emotional support animal, if it's not a service animal, then it is a pet. OK, tenants, if your landlord says that there is absolutely no pets on the property, then that's the rule. If you know you cannot adhere to that, don't put yourself in a tricky situation where now you're forced to move or to get rid of it. And then, you know, things can become sometimes confrontational because you have an attachment to those animals. Find a place where pets are allowed. Some landlords do welcome pets. Okay. All right. So those are the tips that I wanted to share today. That's the information that I wanted to share. I talked about the seven dangers in rental housing. I gave tips for landlords. I gave tips for tenants. Um, and again, this is what I do each and every Monday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on this social media channel, whether you're watching by way of Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter. This is where you can find me each and every week. Let me just also say this, that if you have not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, please go over to that YouTube channel, smash that subscribe button so that you'll be the first to know when I am live and online. And every week I give different topics, different information. Sometimes I'll do Q&A. Um, if you have questions, if I'm not on the air, let me give you my email address. All right, Dr. Baker, you said I've seen properties destroyed by pets. They don't want to pay $50 more monthly to house their dog, but feed them babies real good. Listen, Dr. Baker, people will do what they do. They don't want to, no, they don't want to pay. Why would they, listen, some tenants feel like they shouldn't have to pay $50 extra for their pet because they love their pets just that much. And I get it, right? That's an added cost. They already have to pay for pet food and you know, they don't want to have to pay that extra $50 a month because if you add that up at the end of the day, at the end of the year, that's that's an expense, right? They can put that money somewhere else. So I get it. You know, people are trying to cut costs. People are trying to save money. I get it. I get it. I, I don't fault them for not wanting to pay that extra money, but I just still recommend that maybe tenants find a landlord who will allow them to bring those pets in. Now, Dr. Baker, I've, I've seen a tenant uh, I think this was about a, about two, three weeks ago, a tenant moved out of a rental property. She had a huge dog. It was a beautiful dog. I don't know what kind of dog it was, but it was so pretty. And it wasn't a husky, but it was along the line of a husky. And she took great care of that rental property. And I was surprised because the flooring throughout that property is wood, hardwood floors. And normally, sometimes dogs, they'll, they can scratch the floors, but there was not one scratch on the floor throughout their property. I did the walkthrough with the owner and I told the owner that that tenant um, is a great tenant to see if they could get that tenant to stay because she had been there, I believe like 10 years and took really good care of the property. She kept it up and all that owner had to do was um, maybe a light coat of paint, clean it, sanitize it and uh, put it back online because sometimes tenants will do a good job taking care of rental properties. And so if you're a landlord and you have a tenant that's taking care of your property like that, go ahead and reward them. All right. Try to get them to stay because you don't know what that next tenant is going to do. You don't know the behavior of that next tenant. So that is all I have to say about that there. So let me share my email address. If you have questions when I'm not online, please email me. That is my email address there at the bottom of the screen, info at landlordlife.com. 
And again, if this information has been helpful for you today, please share it. Thank you for those of you who have shared it already. Thank you for joining me today. And again, please make sure that you tune in each and every Monday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and again, by way of announcement, I just want to invite landlords I now have uh, created or yeah, I'll say I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and put it out there since I've said it already and I've shared it before. I have created a three day online landlord boot camp. If you want more information about that, please email me for more information. Please stay connected with me. This is where you can find me, guys and ladies each and every Monday, 730 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm super excited that you join me today. And I look forward to seeing you all next Monday at 7.30 p.m. right here on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. And don't forget, y'all, go and subscribe to my YouTube channel. All right. Going to say bye for now. And I'll see you all next week.